Hello, everyone, and welcome to Room for Discussion. Today, we're flipping the script of finance. Forget about Wall Street. Green Street is where a deal, a real deal is. Now picture this, a world where carbon credits are traded as stocks, where green bonds as are, are as valuable as gold, and where sustainability isn't just a checkbox, it's the future of finance. Barbara Bausma is a true leader in green finance. From her time at being the CEO at Rabo Carbon Bank to her being the chief economist at PwC, she has tirelessly been working to realign the rules of money with sustainability. Um, uh, in this hour, we will discuss uh, the, uh, how banks and companies can uh, realign um, their rules to achieve growth. Please welcome Barbara Bausma. So where would you like me yes. to sit? Here? Please have a seat, yes, on our semi-comfortable couches. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you for coming again to Room for Discussion. Yes. It's your fourth time now. I didn't uh, know about that. But, uh... <laughs> yeah, on the couches for the third time. And you are a professor at UVA, head economist of PwC Netherlands. And also before that, you were the CEO of the Rabo Carbon Bank and also worked in Rabo Bank, as we established earlier. Where do you feel most at home? Uh, actually, I feel at home in the combinations of roles that I have because for me, my passion is economics. And um, economics is for me about how can we create more welfare, and you're economist, at least I hope you know about economics, welfare is always broad welfare to economists, it's like utility, life satisfaction, happiness, those kinds of stuff. So it's much, how can we ha create as much happiness, life satisfaction to as many people as possible? Mm -hmm. And if I want to work on that, I can't do that from one role only. So as being a professor of economics, I can study economics uh, and I can work with you, with students, um, be working within the real economy, now at PwC, before mm -hmm. at Rabobank, I can help to make changes within the real economy, working with businesses and so on. And then in between, I have some other roles, which we call in Dutch, polder rollen. Those of you who are non-Dutch <laughs> should know the word polder by now. It's actually the institutions where we set up compromises between public and private um, domain. And it's, for instance, a monitoring committee corporate mm -hmm. governance. Uh, it's uh, being the chairperson of the bank council of the Dutch Central Bank, the Dutch Committee of Entrepreneurship. And that gives me the position to think along with self-regulation, mm -hmm. with laws and, and other institutions to make sure that the economy is actually working to increase welfare for more people. Yeah. So it's, where do I feel at home? In the combination of those three roles, which mm -hmm. give me a very rich perspective on my passion, economics. And we'll explore your professional influence later on during this interview. But for some people, academic research is less, has less tangible effects. How do you see your research contributing to the advancement of sustainability efforts? Well, let's go back way when I was a PhD student, way back, I want to say, at the, at the Tinbergen University, of uh, Tinbergen Institute, which is a great institute. Um, I wrote a PhD on putting price tags on environmental goods. I had to say it a little bit more mm -hmm. popular, yeah. uh, pricing externalities. And one of the case studies I did was on putting um, a price tag on noise nuisance around Schiphol. Mm -hmm. which at the time was uh, very much at the, 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 the center of the public debate was because they were debating should there be um, extra landing strips, should there be growth of Schiphol, or should it actually not grow anymore. And those price tags we were able to um, come up with, they were used in a social cost-benefit analysis by government. Mm -hmm. So... Doing it was theor first. It was theor theoretically based. Then we did an empirical study, and based on that, we could uh, use that in mm -hmm. real life yeah. policy debate. Uh, do you feel like your time in the corporate world helps you get out of the ivory tower and improves your research in that aspect? 
Well, I'm a prof professor of applied economics, so I very much believe that for me, being the person that I am, um, I want to apply what I do. That's why I also work with, the, always have been working in the real economy and not just being a professor mm. of economics, because I want to apply what I research, what I learn at academics, and uh, what I learn from reading papers by others, and apply that into real life circumstances and help firms to actually take the route towards greening their uh, business profile or to increase the, the welfare of their sh stakeholders, not shareholders, stakeholders. <laughs> uh, also shareholders, but that's just one of the stakeholders. Uh, aside from the previously mentioned occupations, you also appear a lot on TV and in newspapers. Do you feel like it's the obligation of an academic to enter the public sphere and translate your research to the general public? Not an obligation. Um, but I think, especially nowadays, but also when I first did this, was like in a financial crisis. Because then um, it wasn't... Uh, a normal thing for economists to be on television, but then we had a financial crisis and oh, there were questions mm. about what's happening. And they needed economists to actually help to, um, well, to understand and interpret what was happening out there. So also in very popular shows. And ever since then, economists have a seat at the table mm. to discuss about other things that have been happening since then. But I don't feel it's an obligation, but... Uh, I think that nowadays, especially where, well, there, are, there is something like alternative facts, eh? mm -hmm. something that mm -hmm. Trump invented, um, it's very good to have the facts straight. Mm -hmm. And there I see that academics, in general, has an obligation uh, to bring in the facts and mm -hmm. to stick to the facts. Um, yeah. And your interest in sustainability has been a crucial part of your career now for many years, you mentioned your PhD dissertation. Were you always passionate about this, or was there any particular event that sparked your interest? No, I, I wasn't this particular event. I was born in 1969, which was almost the same year that the Club of Rome mm -hmm. came with their famous report, The Limits to Growth. And growing up in the 70s, I, I, I saw we had the oil crisis, mm -hmm. and... So it was already about pollution, much more about pollution than climate change or other things. And I remember that this that you wanted to swim in certain rivers was impossible because of pollution. So it, yes, it has always been um, an interest of me, but top of mind, mm -hmm. it became when I was in, I think, high school. And, um, and also I remember very much here at university, there was the Brundtland report. And mm -hmm. Brundtland was actually... The first was the OECD report, perhaps you know it. It was the report where, for the first time, the term um, sustainable and sustainability was coined in, in let's say, the, more like the green, mm -hmm. uh, gr the greening of the economy uh, um, connotation. So that was what influenced me. Okay. Uh, you started working on sustainability before it was as in the public consciousness as it is now. Do you ever feel like, or did you ever feel like that interest wasn't completely understood? It wasn't taken that seriously because <laughs> when I was here at the university, um, well, way back, uh, then it was all about macroeconomics, microeconomics, and if you did something that was really taken seriously. But um, actually, I wanted to study mathematics. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, so I first actually went to the technical university in Delft to study. I, so, but then I made the wrong choice. This was in 1988, and it was still the time when there were marketing campaigns on, and this is in Dutch, I'm sorry, Thea studeert technique. So they wanted to have girls coming into the technical university, mm -hmm. and they had this stupid campaign, and they saw, they saw me, with uh, there was a crowd with guys, and there were a few girls, and they <laughs> selected them and say, oh, you want to study mathematics? Perhaps it's better if you do industrial design or architecture. Mm -hmm. That's better for you. And stupidly, <laughs> I, I followed their advice, yeah. and I did industrial design, mm -hmm. which is, for me, wasn't, that wasn't why I was there. I, wanted, I should have taken mm -hmm. mathematics, 
But okay, I did industrial design for a year, did quite a lot of lectures within the mathematical <laughs> faculty, <laughs> mathematics faculty, but then I decided I also wanted to work on not just mathematics, but apply mathematics mm -hmm. in, in a way to increase it, uh, the welfare for as mm -hmm. many people as possible. I didn't have the words right then, but yeah. I wanted to make mathematics work for the happiness of people. And then I came to, to economics. Mm -hmm. So yes, I did environmental economics, but always with lots of mathematics in it. Yeah. And today, I don't know whom of you wants to work in sustainability or sustainable finance. Please make sure that you're not afraid of big data sets and working with big data sets, that you can code, that you can do programming, that you can do R or Python or whatever. If you work, want to work in sustainable finance, you need to be able to work with data because that's what it's all about. It's mm. not about knowing, yes, it's about knowing about the planetary boundaries. Yes, is knowing about what climate change is all about. But that's like a precondition. Yeah. If you really want to work there and make a difference, you should be able to work with data and not be afraid of mathematics. Mm -hmm. So now sustainability has become more a prominent topic. Yeah. Um, how do you think the way we discuss it evolved throughout the years, especially given that because it's a, such a prominent topic, it is more prone to the more divisive opinions? Yeah. Well, again, I bring in the facts. Yeah. Uh, and I stick to the facts. Mm -hmm. I won't go into this polarized debate. I see there is a polarized mm -hmm. debate. So you see it more. So what I... Uh, what I do is I want to understand, and I've learned from this actually, I have one lesson from it, because I was so uh, much thinking about greening the economy that I spent, I didn't spend enough time about thinking about the social part of it, mm -hmm. the societal part of it, the uh, part of it where actually people have enough funds themselves to invest in greening their own uh, life circumstances. For instance, not everybody can buy an electrical vehicle, not everybody can buy uh, solar panels mm -hmm. and so on. And so before we can, are able to green the economy, perhaps we should spend more, I should spend more time on thinking about how we can make that socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. And at first I only, I, I looked at greening too much and less on the social acceptance mm -hmm. part. And even now, though, sustainability is, doesn't get enough attention, some people think. I, I'm sorry, but if you mm -hmm. are going to write a thesis, <laughs> could you please write a thesis on how you, okay, how you can put greening into a business model of a firm? We can get our head around that. It's easier now, but how do you get social impact in the earning model in the business model of a firm. If that's not going to happen, it will always be charity. It will always mm -hmm. be like feel good instead of earning a buck. And if it's not about earning a buck, then it won't be taken as seriously yeah. by firms as it should be. Mm -hmm. And now that I've, I've realized that ESG, uh, you know, about environmental, social, mm -hmm. and the governance, I can talk about governance yeah. later, but. The E and the S are equally important. It's not just about E. They go hand in hand. And we can put E in the business model of firms, but I don't know yet about S. So mm -hmm. you are the future. Tell us how we can do yeah. that. Come up with great instances. I've worked on one social enterprise where I thought I could do that. Is, mm -hmm. is it okay if I tell yeah, about yeah, that? Yeah, uh, definitely. When I worked at Rabobank, I was for a while the CEO of Rabo Amsterdam. And um, what we, it was in, uh, then COVID hit, and uh, the COVID crisis hit us, and there were farmers um, around Amsterdam who had uh, all of their crops laying on the field, like potatoes, uh, cucumbers, and our, all other stuff. And because the, the fries factories were closed, because the restaurants were closed, they couldn't do anything with those potatoes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, at the same time, we saw that uh, many people living within the city had not, uh, didn't have enough money to even uh, buy food, fresh food. So we combined the two things together in a social enterprise, which is called in Dutch, Boeren voor Buren, Farmers for the Neighbors. So farmers 
living close to the city, working mm. for, the, for the people in the city. And um, those people who were not able to go to the food banks because they couldn't prove that their income was lowered because of the COVID crisis, because they were, um, well, working in the black market or mm -hmm. whatever, or inform doing informal uh, labor, um, they were actually, we could help them. Yeah. And this is how, this, this enterprise still exists today. And now it works together with the municipality of Amsterdam and with many others. And it still is a social enterprise. And that's for the first time that I realized you can combine two things. You can combine the social impact and the greening of the economy because there's less food waste now um, and, well, and many other things. But that's, that is one example that, that I worked on. But mm -hmm. I want to have more examples. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's very interesting. Um, now we're going to move on quickly to your, one of your books, and we're going to circle back to uh, more market-based solutions later. Uh, but in your book, Groene Groei, or Green Growth in English, you emphasize that economic growth uh, is, is essential for economies, and which is why you prefer that over other models for sustainable economics, like donut theory or degrowth. Could you explain why you believe that economic growth is such a vital part of our economies, and why that makes makes green growth a necessity? I wrote this book in... It was published in 2022, and this was at a time where I noticed... I give quite a lot of lectures around the country, and I noticed mm. that there was something like, do we still need economic growth? Mm. Yeah. And I said... That, well, I, I, of course, answered those questions, but I thought there's, there was not uh, a coherent story about that. That's mm. why I wrote mm -hmm. the book. And this... Degrowth, which I, for me, economic growth is not a goal in itself, but it's a means. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's a result of something. It's not uh, an end in itself, as I said. But there, the, the, the most important reason why I think that degrowth is not a real option is because you lose your electorate. Mm -hmm. We first talked about social impact. Um, being perhaps being perhaps more important even to be able to green the economy than anything else. Um, if you have a strategy as a government to do degrowth, what will happen is that your public funds paid for by taxes will shrink. There will be less available to invest in healthcare, to invest in state pensions to invest in all of the, uh, 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 education, eh? we're here, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, um, in, in judicial systems and so on, defense, um, and people who are dependent on that, also social security, who depend on those um, social funds, they think, well, you can say we're going to degrowth, but where are, what, about, what about me? What does that mean if we don't have funds anymore to, to um, invest in quality of health? What if we don't have money to pay for um, uh, the, the tuitions to go to college? Uh, and so on and so on. If, if there's nobody who could pay my uh, social security um, amenities. Mm -hmm. um, and then they will protest against degrowth. And then you can't green the economy. So I think it's much better to not say you're going to de uh, degrow, uh, but you're actually saying, well, uh, we will change the system in a way that it will, that our economy will, uh, go, will be uh, within the planetary boundaries because that is green growth. Mm -hmm. um, and we will have, and here I agree where, very much with the degrowth people, um, we will have very strict environmental regulations, norms, uh, taxes um, uh, and and also compliance, uh, complying with these uh, uh, green laws, um, so that there will be creativity and innovation, um, and then it will still be possible to grow, but then within planetary boundaries, and that is where uh, I think that um, the people who are in favor of degrowth, they they. And they don't reckon with this electorate, which will not accept that because they are dependent on what I said, the social funds. But also, if you want to pay uh, for the cost of aging, 
then you need a little bit of growth. You need some extra uh, public funds. Uh, if you want to redo a distribution of wealth, mm -hmm. um, you also need some uh, extra money in the social, uh, in the public funds. But wh what's this about? Well, if you do tech, if you redistribute one euro from a rich person to a person who has less money, that doesn't cost you one euro, but it will cost you the uh, more than that. That's the cost of taxation. Economists know what this is, but mm. I have noticed that, for instance, political scientists are less aware of this. But it's not like you can spend one euro from the treasury and it will cost you one euro. No, it will cost mm. you more. Actually, the marginal cost of taxation, so the, the last euro you spend from treasury for redistribution of income from people who have, are richer to people who are poorer, will cost you one euro and 50 cents. That 50 cents is it's welfare loss um, uh, because people react to, uh, mm. ta to taxation. Mm. They will work less hour if the marginal uh, uh, tax rates are too high. They will spend less on education, uh, lifelong learning, because... Um, the proceeds from that, they will be taxed away. They will do less innovation because the proceeds from that or the revenues, they will be taxed away and so on and so on. There will be tax evasion. There will even be people moving from a country like Gérard Depardieu, for instance. Um, he was actually a tax immigrant to first Russia and then Belgium. Not the best example, but okay. Uh, so there are costs to taxation. And if you want to be able to pay for that, you need some extra money in treasury. And where does the extra money in treasury come from? That comes from economic growth. So by stating up front, yeah. we should stop economic growth, you actually say, we will stop putting extra money in treasury, we will stop doing all of those really important public uh, services that we have at this point in time in the Netherlands at quite a high level. We will stop doing all of the social security, and then people will vote against that. So I'm very pragmatic here. Mm -hmm. If you want to green, you need some public funds, you need some growth uh, to be able to, co to pay for the cost of taxation, to be able to uh, pay for the cost of aging. Uh, so you and, just and, but I'm very yeah. sorry, comma, mm -hmm. yeah. that is not to say that current economic growth um, is something that we should strive for. We should change the way in which we grow. For instance, because GDP is a very poor measure of growth because all of the externalities are not part of that. Mm. So let's try to price the externalities and include that in GDP. Um, but then there is also a question, how do we price externalities? Well, I wrote a PhD yeah. on that. It's possible. <laughs> uh, and you can write many theses on that. For now, we are not even, and this is my point, we are not even, there is no green policy out there. It's greenish, it's less grey, but we're not, yeah, we do have a carbon tax, and hey, look, we decoupled our uh, greenhouse gas emissions from economic growth. It's a mm. huge success. Um, but let's go further. What about nitrogen? What about water quality? What about many, many other things? We can put prices to that. And if it's difficult or not accepted by the electorate uh, to put a price tag there, well, then let's do norms. Mm -hmm. um, because right now we're not translating these planetary boundaries. There are like nine of them, and we already pa uh, um, uh, um, passed six of them. Eh? So we are in dire streets. We need to adjust mm -hmm. and translate these planetary boundaries into either, for an economist, the preferred option is um, uh, pricing them, tax taxing and other stuff, or, or having tradable permit systems, whatever. Yeah. Um, or if that's not acceptable, do it in norms. Mm -hmm. with strict compliance. Yeah. And you just mentioned uh, that you're not the biggest fan of the degrowth. Um, and over the past decades, the, there has been economic growth. However, the benefits of that usually went to the top 1%. How can we make sure that the future economic growth, if it's green, is more evenly spread out? Actually, if you look in the Netherlands, our income distribution is 
as even or uneven as it was for decades. Mm -hmm. So please be more precise on what country you're mm -hmm. talking about. And I think that you're talking mainly about the US, yes. UK. And um, I'm, I see that their way of doing capitalism is still, sh still shareholder value capitalism. Yeah, as I, I told in the beginning, I was part of the Monitoring Committee Corporate Governance, which actually um, um, changed the Corporate Governance Code in such a way that the central theme in the Dutch Corporate Governance Code is no longer short-termism with shareholder value, but it's mm -hmm. long, sustainable long-term value creation for a broad set of stakeholders, so that's including clients, citizens, uh, and and employers uh, employees I'm sorry um, and and um, um, yes also shareholders so it's changing the capitalism capitalistic system that we are living in in such a way that you still have the very strong assets from capitalism I mean the incentives the innovative part of it we'll need that in order yeah. to green um, but on the other hand change some of the things that are, have not been changed in the UK and the US? Uh, most current growth um, is so-called grey growth, as you mentioned, and has achieved at the expense of the environment. How can we transition from this grey growth into a future with more green growth? Well, what, what I said for, for, for you, you have grey growth, which is just a traditional uh, way of, of, of having economic growth. You have green growth and you have degrowth. Mm -hmm. And sometimes now in the polarized debate, you see that what's happening, the people who are actually pro-gray growth, so keeping it as it is, don't change too much, um, are trying to uh, set up green growth and degrowthers against each other. And I won't go in that route, because I think that the um, the similarities between people who vote for green growth and degrowth are much uh, larger than the difference between the green growth, um, mm -hmm. uh, the grey growth people. Mm -hmm. So I would say, what actually is the largest similarity between degrowth people and green growth people is that they vote for very strict environmental policies, and that is the answer mm -hmm. to your question: mm -hmm. How do we go from grey to green? That's mm -hmm. by translating the planetary boundaries, those nine boundaries into sound, effective, efficient uh, policies, as I said. Mm. Sorry to repeat mm -hmm. myself, but um, uh, pricing, norms, mm -hmm. transparency also, and, and compliance. Uh, one thing you also talk a lot about is green finance, and your book stresses that the financial sector often waits for political guidance, but that, that um, approach is outdated and that we need a mindset change and that the financial sector needs to lead the way to the green transition. How can we make sure that mindset change happens? And isn't that something that is maybe a bit um, unlikely, looking at the current state of the financial sector, looking more for profits than maybe uh, sustainability? Um, a large change is happening in the financial sector. Mm. As I said before, I'm very much in favor of very strict environmental regulation. Mm -hmm. But if I look outside, it's not happening. Mm -hmm. Because in this fragmented and polarized world, politicians are afraid to directly intervene into the real economy with taxes, with norms, and so on. Because that might be framed as, you're taking away my meatball. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And they don't want that, because mm -hmm. that will cost them voters. So what they do, instead of taking this direct route of regulation into the real economy, they take the indirect route via the financial system. Mm -hmm. So lots is happening within the financial system. If you want to write a thesis, look into this one. All of the regulation that is coming now at pension funds, insurance companies and banks, which actually gives them... Um, the opportunity, I wanted to say, mm -hmm. but also the, obliga the obligation mm -hmm. to green the economy. And that's much stricter than lots of people think, uh, because it's not been written about in the newspapers mm -hmm. enough. But this indirect route with regulating via the balance sheet of banks, via the P&Ls of uh, pension mm -hmm. funds, um, to steer towards greening the economy, 
uh, that's happening right now in their capital requirements, for instance, and so on. It's, and that, for politicians, it's much easier to do because it won't cost them voters. If a banker mm -hmm. has to say to a farmer, I won't finance that because you're not transitioning fast enough from grey to green, and I will finance you because you take on the transition seriously, then it's the banker who is to blame and not the politicians. So that's why politicians more and more take this indirect route. And I think that the financial sector should be more aware of this mm -hmm. fact. Of course, they see the regulation coming and they want to comply to it, but they do it because they have to, not because they want to. And I think that has to change. If you look at that regulation, if you look at the planetary boundaries and think how with all the capital that we have, mm -hmm. and yes, also with the, um, all the rules and regulations that are out there, which give us actually, as people within the financial sector, a legitimate position to be the, gate, the green uh, gate uh, keeper, so to say, mm -hmm. and to actually say to the one farmer, I'm not going to finance you, to the other, I'm going to finance you. Um, you should use, use that more often. But what I see in reality is like the boss of UBS, the yeah. CEO of UBS, mm -hmm. he was like at Bloomberg the mm -hmm. other day and he was stating, we're not the climate police. Well, my answer would be, yes, you are. Mm -hmm. You have been mm -hmm. given this legitimate gate, green gatekeeper position because mm -hmm. of the regulation. Mm -hmm. So is this change in the mindset can happen only because of regulation right now? Or maybe because we know that companies prefer short-term profits or, and then they tend to discount the long-term ones. And you mentioned that green investments may carry some initial risks. Is this switch in mindset available only for regulation right now? Or can we somehow con convince companies, investors, you should pursue this? Um, yes, we do need regulation, strict mm -hmm. green regulation with compliance. Uh, but it's not enough. Mm -hmm. So I think the realization for financial institutions that it's in their own best interest mm -hmm. to green the economy. For instance, if you look at all the flooding that happened in Central Europe in the recent months, that has a huge damage. There are houses being damaged. That's actually the collateral for many banks uh, when they do mortgages. Mm -hmm. And if there's damage to their collateral, it will be damage to their balance sheet. So it's... I just, just want to, or insurance companies who have to pay for all of the repair costs and so on uh, via the, the people who have an insurance. Um, so there will be huge damage uh, to the balance sheets and the P&Ls of mm -hmm. those financial uh, um, uh, institutions if the economy won't green. So it's in their self-best interest. Um, and also... It's not just in their self-best interest because they want to, because otherwise there will be damages. We can also put it in a more positive way. Um, we did, when I worked at Rabobank, that we did research on, we, we did, I don't know if there are any econometricians here, but, uh, oh, I'm sorry. That we did a difference in difference analysis, that's econometrics. What did we do? We had like uh, um, tens of thousands of SMEs and we could score them based on their sustainability score. So very high, really green, and really gray, then you had a really low score. And we could check for all of the other variables. So they were in the same sector, same sort of profitability, um, same financing structure. They only differed in terms of their sustainability score. And then we looked at the... Um, probability of default, so the risk that they weren't going to pay back the loan or weren't going to pay back the interest fees that they were supposed to, to uh, pay back. And what we noticed is that the higher the sustainability score, the lower this probability of default. Mm. Um, and this was actually mm -hmm. a, an advantage for the bank itself. Mm -hmm. So they were then thinking about, whoa, if we have much lower credit risk cost, if we have a, if the if there we have lots of sustainable clients, and then at once because it was part of their internal pricing mm -hmm. model, mm -hmm. so not just actor external prices with taxes and mm -hmm. uh, 
pre, uh, pro, uh, trading permits and so on, but it was in their internal pricing model, which is in a bank, the credit risk modeling, that's where the interest fees are, are calculated and so on. And then for green client, at, there was a lower interest fee. Uh, and, and then it starts mm -hmm. to work. So if, if you have, yes, the external pricing, mm -hmm. but also the internal pricing mechanism, and also pension funds um, uh, and insurance companies have their own internal pricing mechanism and include, that's why I said beforehand, don't be afraid of data. Because now where you see the largest changes within um, financial uh, institutions is where you see this internal pricing mechanism, the credit risk modeling within banks being um, complemented with environmental information, with sustainability information. So it becomes a much richer credit modeling. Mm -hmm. And the more information it has on sustainability, the more you can steer with interest rates or other financial conditions towards greening the economy. And that's why we need you to be able to work with data, because sustainable finance is all about changing the credit risk modeling, about the internal pricing system. Um, that's what's happening right now. That's why I need you to also understand mathematics. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I think it's high time to open the floor to some audience questions. Uh, if you have a question, you can raise your hand and someone with a microphone will come to you. Yes. Right there in the back. Hi. You talked about green growth uh, and we're still needing to grow the economy. What parts of the economy do you mean when you want to grow them and how? And with how I mainly aim at, at what cost and at whose costs? I'm not saying that we need to grow as an aim, but, nor, but as a, uh, we need it to, to be able to have public funds uh, to pay for all of the nice things that the public services that we have. That isn't to say that every part of the economy can still grow. Those who have, very, uh, have a very high ecological footprint, once we have effective green policies in place, won't be able to have a viable business case anymore. Uh, that, for instance, has to do with part of the cattle farming, with part of the uh, transport sec uh, sector, uh, with uh, part of the petro petrochemical uh, industry. Those, in, those parts of the economy who can't transition to a green economy or don't want to or un are unable to do that um, in an economically sensible way, we, that will th those parts of the economy will shrink, will degrowth, and then there will be more room for others to, go, uh, to grow and flourish. And what kind of activities that will be, we don't know that yet. So, um, but if you have the incentives in place with norms and with pricing systems, then there will be creativity, innovation in ways that we don't even imagine right now. And that's where I differ from degrowth people who think they already know what will shrink, what will grow. I think. I'm much more an economist there, and I think let's put the incentives in place to make sure that we keep within planetary boundaries, and what will happen then is a reshuffling within the economy, even going to fields where we don't know yet. So to be very honest, also sometimes the degrowth people say, but you don't, you aren't sure that it will be, that we will be able, if you put the incentives right, to stay within the planetary boundaries, and then my honest answer is yes, that's true, I don't know that for certain. But I know one thing for certain, if we would transition from this, from our system nowadays to a degrowth system that will simply take too long because of the electoral, um, uh, the, the, the lack of electoral support for that. And you're not certain yourself if degrowth will keep you within or uh, will get you within the planetary boundaries. You're not certain yourself. Look at the COVID crisis when uh, we had a huge plump in economic activity, the, the pollution was still there. Uh, it was, there were still carbon dioxide e uh, uh, emissions. It, so it didn't, you don't know whether uh, shrinking the entire economy will help you to get within the planetary boundaries. We know for certain that shrinking part of the economy 
like I said, petrochemics, part of it, a uh, certain part of cattle farming, and now uh, I, well, uh, those activities with really large ecological footprints that don't want or can't transition to green, those we will need to shrink or remove to other places where it's less harmful. Yes, I saw we had another question. Yes, gentleman in the hat. Yeah, I'm interested in the uh, electoral support thing because uh, for degrowth, of course, I understand that there would not be any electoral support, but also with green growth, uh, strict environmental regulations, um, they also don't really have any electoral support. So how do you create that? Because we see in the Netherlands now, everybody's voting for the PVV and the Baby Bay, so there's not really uh, any support in the electoral base for environmental regulations. How do you create that? This is what I said before. What I have learned during the years is that you also have to take seriously the S in ESG. Yes, we need to talk about how to, how to allocate uh, the wealth and the welfare that we have in such a way that everybody feels enabled to go into that green transition. And we must also be very honest that that also might mean that sometimes, yes, we do eat less animal protein. Because it's simply impossible to keep having so much animal protein in our diets uh, if the planetary boundaries are, are pressing in this way. But if you do it in a way that is that, that, that you have really good alternatives that are cheaper, actually, and are uh, even uh, really nice to eat. For instance, let's make it very practical. We set up this social enterprise, uh, Boer for Boer, as I told you. And then in, during COVID crisis, when restaurants were closed, there were lots of chefs in Amsterdam who were, were, were out of, of work. And a few of those chefs in Michelin star restaurants helped us because there were quite a lot of vegetables coming in from the fields from farmers um, around Amsterdam to the people in Amsterdam. And those were vegetables where you think, what should I do with it? Like beets and, and certain carrots and things that you thought, how am I going to make this, cook this into a meal that's really tasty? And then those chefs put their recipes next to it, and then it was accepted. There was even a very vivid community sharing recipes. So it's very much about also that social aspect and, and making it a tasty alternative next to, affordable tasty alternative next to it. Is it easy? No. But then also ask the same voters, do you want your children and grandchildren to be able to have the same level of happiness, life satisfaction, or welfare as you currently have, and the same level of public services that we can currently enjoy, then their answer will be yes. And then I think if you reason then back to today, then if you, if you put it in a long-term vision like that, perhaps, I don't know, of course, for certain, uh, but perhaps you can have more voters who will vote uh, in favor. And one Last thing, what I also learned is that people don't like tra transition. They don't like change. They have loss aversion. Um, so if you keep stressing that greening the economy, will we will need to transition in that way, that way, and you keep stressing the transition, the changing part of it, instead of saying um, it's about keeping what we have, so it's not about transitions, but traditions. It's about conserving what you have. It's very conservative. If you stress more that part, it's about framing also. Do you want to keep what you have right now? And then you have their yes, you have their vote. But in order to be able to keep what we have right now, we'll make some changes. But then your emphasis is on keeping what you have right now. But... Uh, but uh, but but that's this is outside of my. <laughs> I'm just an economist, <laughs> but, but the political science here can look into this. But i i when I talk to people, I notice that traditions are better than transitions. So, mm. okay, um, so thank you for these questions. Uh, we have now discussed your general stance on green growth, in which actors are important, but you've also played a key role in those actors. So we want to dive deeper into that. 
Uh, from 2001, uh, 2021, excuse me, 2023, you were the CEO of the Rabin Carbo Bank, promoting sustainable agricultural practices and carbon credits. Could you please explain more how that worked? Um, for me, carbon credit is a means, not an end. Mm -hmm. But I, th uh, I think we, the world needs to be fed, so we need agriculture. Um, but we also, if you look at uh, agriculture, it emits like 25% of all global uh, mm -hmm. greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, but also, uh, world population is still increasing, so we need to bring, say, double our food production worldwide, mm -hmm. but at the same time decrease the greenhouse gas emissions, let's just talk about climate, not all the other planetary boundaries, but to decrease our uh, carbon dioxide equivalent emissions with a three-quarter. So mm -hmm. this is what we need to do. At the same time, double production and, at the, and, and also reduce greenhouse gas emissions massively. You can only do that if you fundamentally change the way in which we produce food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... Being working at Rabobank, which is the largest food and egg bank in the world, I no longer work at Rabobank, so I can only talk about what I did right back then, um, is how can we help make sure that we finance that fundamental change in the food system? Um, and then I thought at my, uh, on the PhD that I once wrote, mm -hmm. and that is how can we put a money, uh, a price tag on things that are valuable to us, but not mm -hmm. priced in the market. And farmers, they actually, what they provide to us is not just food, but also ecosystem services. Mm -hmm. What's that? Well, let's take a very important one. It's a healthy soil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A healthy soil is more biodiverse, um, is better for water resilience, um, better for pest control, and so on. So the healthier your soil, the better it is for food production and all of the other ecosystem services around it. But, and there is one other thing, and that's where the money comes in. A healthier soil can absorb more carbon dioxide mm -hmm. from the atmosphere, that is now adding to the greenhouse effect to climate change, and absorb it into the soil. And one ton of carbon dioxide equivalent stored in a healthy soil per hectare is one carbon credit. And if I can use the voluntary carbon credit market mm -hmm. to be able to pay the farmer for this ecosystem service, then I'll use credits. But as a means, not mm -hmm. as an end, because mm -hmm. the end is a healthy soil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One common criticism towards carbon credits is that it focuses on offsetting, not uh, reducing the emissions. Um, so companies technically can continue business as usual and then offset with carbon credits. Um, was this something that you particularly look for, that this greenwashing didn't happen when you were working at Rob? Uh, 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 greenwashing is not greenwashing. For, uh, okay, um, let's take away a step back. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the global carbon cycle, we emit globally over... 50 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent every year into the atmosphere. Yeah. And as I said, food and ag is like 25% of that. But once in the atmosphere, and many people don't know this, 60% mm -hmm. remains there and 40% is absorbed back by the earth, by land, yes, mostly farmland, forest, trees, and oceans. Those are the three carbon sinks in the world. And... Although it is really important to make sure that we don't emit as much, so reduction is the first and best option mm -hmm. we have, it is equally important to make sure that that 40% that is now absorbed back by the natural carbon sink increases and there is all of the carbon dioxide equivalent that's in the atmosphere, more is taken out and uh, absorbed back by the, those natural carbon sinks. That's not greenwashing. Mm -hmm. That's helping to fight combat climate to combat climate change, um, and how can we make sure? So I focused with uh, in the Car Rabo Carbon Bank at the time, at how can we make sure that there much more is absorbed back by healthy soils, 
And that's, again, not greenwashing because a healthy soil is um, very important for all many of the planetary boundaries. And then, the, okay, if I use carbon credits to be able to pay for that, mm -hmm. I'm totally fine with that. Farmers should also try to reduce. And uh, food producers should try to produce. So the, I don't know, the, the food processing companies... And, and all of us should try to reduce, but that's not to say that removal from the atmosphere, so not just reduction, but also removal isn't also important. Mm -hmm. Because even if we would stop emitting today, there will still be global warming. Yeah. So it's also important to take out from the atmosphere and put mm -hmm. it back into our natural things. So that's not greenwashing. What's greenwashing is if you have like cowboy carbon credits, mm -hmm. Um, for instance, if you have credits that um, uh, where you're not sure whether it's indeed absorbed yeah. uh, in, in carbon sinks, or um, uh, and where it's an excuse for companies not to re also reduce. So we only sold those carbon credits to companies who were very seriously first and foremost reducing, mm -hmm. and on top of that, because they want to be net zero and couldn't go to zero immediately, for the remaining um, emissions to removals or offsetting. Yeah, we are slowly coming to the end of the interview and we also want to cover your role of the, as the chief economist of PwC. Um, you left Rabo Carbon Bank, you joined PwC in last December. What made you change those positions? Um, what I've noticed, not just at Rabobank, but broadly within the economy, is that lots of companies are now um, getting the basics in order. Mm -hmm. So they are reducing their costs. They are looking at um, issues from the past, actually, uh, complex IT systems, making it more simple. They are uh, trying to uh, cope with compliance. Um, mm -hmm. And then they have the incidents of the day. And they, there is not that much time to think about the future. And I want to think about the future. Yeah. So I was thinking, where should I work? And I talked to many, many people uh, within the uh, financial sector, but also at firms. And then I asked them, when do you think about the future? Mm -hmm. And then they said, when I'm in a, like a think tank-like uh, situation, mm -hmm. I thought, well, I'm a professor of economics already, yeah. so I'm not going to do that uh, twice. Um, I mean, that's also like think tank reflection and so mm -hmm. on. That's, uh, and the other thing is when I talk to an advisor or a consultant or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I thought at this point in time, for me, it is a very good place to work at a consultancy mm -hmm. and to actually give headspace to all of those firms dealing with the issues from the past, dealing with the incidents of today, and to actually give them time to reflect also on the future and to think along with them what you can do. Yeah. And not just in terms of greening, but also increasing your productivity and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and dealing with aging and dealing with all of the other yeah. things that are coming at them. Yeah. So the first day you came into the office, what was the most significant change you experienced? Was that this broader look? No, I always, that's because I have these different positions. Yeah. Um, what, what I very much like at PwC is the client base. Mm -hmm. So I, I can work with clients and really make an impact. Um, uh, and that is really, really nice. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, and the other thing I really liked very much is that I work with professionals who are really smart, and I can. Spe they are specialized in in things that I don't know that much about. And I think together, you can build solutions. Um, and and that specialization, you need that. You can't all be generalist. Yeah. And I have a specialization, my colleagues have specializations, and together we can offer solutions. Mm -hmm. And that is what would really help me right now. Uh, we talked a little bit about the need for the government regulation, but the current Dutch government is quite critical over the past climate policy uh, and say they want to favor market-based solutions. Do you agree with the new approach or not? I'm sorry, I didn't get the final part of it. Oh, sorry. Who is and in favor of what? Of market-based solutions, the current uh, government wants to focus more on market-based solutions for climate change. Well, I, I don't. I think that um, a pricing strategy, if that's what you call market-based, mm -hmm. using the price mechanism to have the incentive right uh, towards greening, I completely get that. I'll, 
but I, at the same time, I'm very, um, uh, I know that you can't put price tags to everything that's valuable to us, mm -hmm. so you also need norms, and again, compliance and transparency. That's mm -hmm. why CS triple D is important, CSRD is important to report in a transparent way, so that you can see, hey, that's greenwashing, and, and that's mm -hmm. actually going green. But so do you believe in the current approach by the new government or...? The new government um, is not very ambitious when it comes to uh, greening the economy. Not mm -hmm. ambitious enough. I'm afraid to say so. Yeah. So we're coming to this end of the interview. After leaving this interview, what would be the one main takeaway that you would like the audience to have after hearing all of this? Um... Write a thesis about this indirect <laughs> way uh, of, of what's happening now at the financial sector. Please look deeply into what the requirements are currently for the uh, financial sector and how you, with your knowledge, with the things that you learned at university, can help to, to embrace that instead of fighting it and saying, we're not the climate police. How can you make sure that you that your internal pricing mechanism at the financial sector actually changed in a way that it's in their own best interest to go green. And I, I hope that you take away that you can make a huge difference there based on what you learn, I hope, at university, at this university. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Bausma, for this interview. Let's thank our guests with some applause. Uh, if you can't get enough of room for discussion, then I have good news. Uh, on the 9th of October, we have an interview with Prince Konstantin. On the 17th, with Gary Stevenson. And on the 23rd, we have Carl Graybert, the CEO of Nike. We hope to see you then.